around him? Well, I think that's a big part of being a midfield player now because almost every team or most teams, you want to play for a top team. They're going to play from the back and they're going to play through midfield. So you've got to be able to deal with pressure. And also on the flip side of that, most teams now, the way the game is played, is people want to press high. They want to get after the opposition and push up the pitch. So as a midfield player, you've got to be pressure resistant. You've got to be able to handle pressure. And we actually look at him where he ranks, not just for midfield players, but the Premier League across every position. And you look at this graphic here and two Manchester City players at the top, Rhys James there also. But Bruno Gamara is there in fourth position over the right across the Premier League and shows how good he is when he gets pressed and he hasn't got time on the ball and he can deal with it. And it just, I just think it's fascinating the way we sort of define certain midfield yeah. players now, Roy. And we, we look at someone like that and it just reminds me a bit like if when I was a kid growing up, you know, a Brian Robson, a, a Peter Reid, yourself, Patrick Vieira. It wasn't just about my job to sit in front of the back four. It's actually... Box to box, cover every blade of grass. Does, but does it yeah, feel like that? And does it frustrate you seeing other midfield players? It can be, but I, th I think it's just the way the game is going. Now, again, you, people almost describe their position by the number on their back. But you've got to play what you see, what's in front of you. I used the word there. He's doing what you're supposed to as a midfielder, is it? You're supposed to tick a lot of boxes. Again, and we've seen there in terms of his tackling, his running, he's added a few goals to it. And as I said, he's got that football intelligence, obviously, passing it under pressure. That's a big one for the top players, of course. You've got to do that, particularly in the tight games. We're under pressure in there because it can be 100 miles an hour. And, uh, yeah, listen, he looks a decent player. He is absolutely idolised at St James's Park by the Newcastle fans who are loving life right now. Into the tent. And when we come back, more weekend analysis as we retreated to five goals at the Emirates. Arsenal elated. Liverpool devastated. Villa to come, but Arsenal back on top of the table after beating Liverpool. Manchester City were there, and then Arsenal have managed to overtake them again. And it was a surprise in some senses, because it was only the second time in 15 attempts that Arsenal have beaten Liverpool in the Premier League. But statistically, Jamie, was it a surprise? Were Aston Villa perhaps more dominant than the scoreline suggested? No, I think they were. Uh, I feared that going into the game, that they'd have too much intensity and pace for Liverpool, and I think that was, that was proven. Uh, and again, Liverpool starting the games badly. We, we covered that last weekend. But in terms of Arsenal, I think, I think you know, I've always been a fan of what Mikel Arteta is doing there or trying to do. I love the energy of the team. I love the bravery in terms of going with those young players last year. And I just love the energy in the stadium right now. And that's something I haven't seen since I've been doing this job, if you like, and looking at Arsenal. There's an energy there. There's a togetherness. I mean, the song that they sing, I think, is. North London Forever, uh, Louis Dunford, and it, just listening to it, you, you on your playlist, enthused. No, it's, it, it wasn't on Sunday night, but you can just feel something. But in terms of liking the manager, I, I think Mikel Arteta is fantastic. I do, in terms of how he gets his team playing and their actual setup. But I think tactically he's really good. I'm just interested in watching. Certainly, just going through the goals. So I just want to Liverpool went with you know that four up top, if you like. But what was really interesting for me was they were desperate to show Liverpool to this left side. Positions of Saka and Odegaard almost trying to stop the ball going into Liverpool's central midfield players. Martinelli's on the far side and look at Jesus, he's stopping the ball going to Matip. So it's, we want to push it to this side. <clears throat> then Liverpool, I want to look at the actual setup now. So stop now. This is really good. You actually look at Ben White, as soon as that ball goes, he's actually looking over his shoulder there at Salabar as if like, I'm going, are you coming? And he's going full back to full back, and then everybody has got to get across. So that's my job, Salabar's got to get here, and don't forget, then that leaves you three at the back against four. So it was brave, on the front foot, but as soon as that ball goes there, you see these two players now. Retreat. Again, tactically, these are the ideas. When the ball comes this side, Ben White's going to fly over. We're all going to come over. But the two central midfield players now, you've got to protect us. Because Liverpool are playing a front four. So we're now 5v4. So we see those four attacking players right across uh, the pitch. They, because the wide players are not... They're not wide players. They're wide strikers, really, in a, in a lot of ways. But again, you see, that's almost like a, a 4v3. Great. It's no good having all that experience if you're not going to use it. And some of the decision making for all the goals there, from Liverpool's point of view, is so poor. It's, it's, it's actually hard to believe what you're watching. A really, really bad um, uh, position player from uh, such experienced players. Can we talk now uh, with Arsenal top of the league after nine games about them 
if not winning it, being City's main challenges this season? Yeah, at the moment, yeah, with all of those. They're playing with confidence. Even the, the game they lost against United recently, they played quite well in the game. It was just it's one of those days where United obviously beat them on the counter-attack. They're playing with confidence. They've got a bit of physicality now in the team, even the two centre-halves. I know they've got a mistake in them, but there's that physical presence. They've got good experience in midfield. They've got young players full of energy, full of talent. They're scoring goals. You mentioned the atmosphere at the ground. It's electric. They've got that momentum. So at this moment, Sam, they're obviously the biggest threat to Man City. Have you heard Jamie's song, North London Forever? No, he gives give a blast. He's got all the lyrics. You know. <laughs> 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 uh, we're here, Roy, on Liverpool on Super Sunday, because their next challenge is uh, Manchester City. Jamie is going to be there as well. We're on air for tonight, though. Our focus is on the Midlands. We're in East Midlands, where Forrest are taking on the West Midlands side, Aston Villa. And that's coming your way in a moment. It's Manchester City followed by Spurs. Keen is our guest tonight. Before you leave us tonight, you'll find out his favourite movies, his favourite holiday destinations, his favourite pundits. I kid you not. Stay with us tonight on Monday Night Football. <laughs> Fuck you. We've got a prize to talk about after that tonight. It finished one apiece between Nottingham Forest and Aston Villa. And uh, before we get on to other subjects, reaction and analysis on the way. but only two of those were on target. Their XG of 0.72 is the lowest that Forest have faced this season, and it's the seventh time in nine games this season that Villa's XG is under one. They're just not creating the quality of chances despite 27 touches in the opposition box and 16 crosses from open play, but 15 of those 16 were unsuccessful, didn't find a man, and they dominated possession as well with 61%. Pretty happy with that point after that run of defeats for Steve Cooper. New contract for him this week, settled a few nerves around the place. Ryan Yates was a real action man. Fouled seven times tonight, giving his reaction to Greg Whelan. Wins from your perspective? Um, you know, we want to be winning games, but you know, we had to stop the rot. We've, we've been losing a lot of games recently. Um, so we had to put that to bed and we want to move forward. What was the game plan? Ourself. Um, do it for everyone connected with the club. You know, we've worked so hard to get in the Premier League. Um, we don't want to be putting on many performances like that again for everyone, including yourself. And, and I think we showed that performance, wasn't it? So it's a deep, the whole. Um, you know, that, that that comes from the front. Um, I thought I thought Dennis up front. You know, came and did did really well. Set the press off for us really well. Um, on to it, just seven minutes. Yeah, and um, you know, that's football. That's the Premier League. You know, you give them. Three or four yards on the edge of the box, you get punished. Um, you were fouled in the build-up too. Yeah, um, but you know, I, I, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, you know, we, we have to defend it better first and foremost. You know, there's, you know, I'm sure we could have, could have defended it better. Things like that happen, and we, we to get us out of it. So you know, we'll look at ourselves first. Treat it like a cup final every single game, especially at the City game. Right, he's giving his reaction to the one-all draw. What did you make of it, Roy, tonight? The game I thought was really, really poor. I thought it was shocking, really quality of, you know, there's some force to be delighted, showed a bit of fighting spirit. Ryan mentioned it there, they need to stop the rot and they'll be delighted with the point, but from Villa's point of view, didn't show, didn't, they've got no bottle that team, that Villa team, you know, for all their so-called attacking players, they didn't do enough to get a result and they'll be kicking themselves, but overall I thought it was a really poor game, but credit to Forrest. They've got something out of the game and maybe something to build on, but real lack of quality so for both teams. You think that Forrest will be encouraged by that? Well, they'll have to be because they've been on such a poor run. And sometimes, we, before every game, sometimes when you're at the bottom, you think it's a must win game. No, it's something just about getting something out of the game, something to hang on to. They conceded the one, but it was a bit, of, showed a bit more spirit than what they have done previously. So, you know, and when, when you're down there, you're looking for any sort of encouragement. And that was probably kind of give them a little bit of a lift. But in terms of quality, it was poor, but. Again, when you're near the bottom, you've got to show something, and Forrest did tonight, but from Villa's point of view, I, I couldn't believe how bad their attacking players were. Would you be as damning about Aston Villa as Roy has been no bottle? 
he says. I think, I'd say more quality. I think in terms of actually the the dominance Villa had in the game, they were much better than than, than Forrest throughout the game. And I'd be interested if you know we, we speak to Steve Cooper. Was it was that by design to make themselves more solid, get behind the ball, or was that Villa pushing them back? We don't know. But that is a problem for Aston Villa. We saw it last week at Leeds, where they were, uh, Leeds were down to ten men. I think they actually created slightly better chances within that game. But to have that much of the ball, that much dominance in the game, and to only work the goalkeeper once besides the goal, to make one save, it doesn't feel like he made a huge amount of saves. And, and with Roy, in terms of their attacking players, on paper you look at them, you think there's sort of four or five really good attacking players there, but they're just not producing at all. And, and Philip Coutinho is just a shadow of a, of a player. We, we know he is because of obviously it didn't go well for him at Barcelona but he's a million miles off it and he's come off again and, and he is the only one attack and play Stevie's bought and you know the, the others were bought by di different players but I, I still think there's quality there but what, what you said as well about the crosses we, we, we analysed Aston Villa before the game about how a Steven Gerrard team plays it plays very narrow it relies a lot on the full backs you know getting forward one of the fullbacks has scored tonight, but their actual quality from wide areas is so poor, it really is, and that's a big reason why they're not scoring goals, and they're not creating really any chances, and, and tonight it wasn't a case of them being defensive or getting behind the ball, they dominated the game in terms of, they were much better than Forrest, but it's not enough in terms of, you know, turning that into goals, and it, uh, probably something I'd, I'd ask you, Roy, in, in to, you've managed, now as a manager you think of, right, I can get organised defensively, but... In terms of attack and play, if you're not scoring, is that on the onus on to you to, to devise a set up a system, or is that sometimes just down to the lack of quality? Yeah, I think. Well, I think they do have the quality, but sometimes it's that lack of courage to try something. But listen, you can come off a, a, a pitch and say, "Listen, it was one one, and it." And the goalkeeper was fantastic. We got loads of shots. We see three shots on target for all their possession. To me, shows a lack of battle or courage to try and hurt teams. Mm. So that that goes back to the personality of the team, which is it's hard for the manager to fix. That comes down to individual players. So point for Nottingham Forest tonight. Steve Cooper is waiting to talk. Well, it's definitely uh, a step in the right direction. Um, it's not the main ambition to be uh, drawing games at home and not having much of the ball, but. Um, the circumstances that uh, that we found ourselves in over the bad run we were having, I think we have to accept tonight that it was a forward step and uh, at, um, at the positives out of the game. I know there was lots of things that we still need to improve on and, and we will aim to improve on, but... Really about getting the process right and almost the result will look after itself. What did you like about the performance? We've obviously been conceding way too many goals, um, but way too many chances and um, I haven't really liked this too much uh, out of possession with our positioning and um, our duels and you know picking up second balls and going with runners so so for all of some of the tactical things we try and do I haven't really loved sometimes the, the, the fight in the team and I know we're, we're trying to put a team together and trying to build a way fully like, like, like we always do and uh, we, at the moment I'm only looking for positives because that's what we need season in the in, in the Premier League and at times last season in the cup games against Premier League teams you really got after them and, and pressed them there's an energy about you and you've played three at the back you've just mentioned the plan was to, to sit off and you've gone to a back four yeah. is, is that something just to almost stop the rot or you know mm. sort of build confidence and you want to get back to that we compare to to last season because uh, it's a completely different team not completely but you know three quarters maybe more is, is different uh, and we've had to stop comparing to last. We'll never forget what happened last season as a club. It was unbelievable. But in terms of the, the football process, you can't compare them because obviously there's so many new players and we're in this league, which is, you know, like a different sport to the, to the championship, I've got to say. If you don't change a little bit, then I think that would be slightly naive from a coaching point of view. So, and uh, we need to build on that. Let's say a table and sort of week or so with lots of things maybe going on behind the scenes. The fans have come out massively sort of and backing you on the job that you did last On the back of five defeats, how has that made you sort of feel, you know, that connection you've got with the supporters? Yeah, the, the supporters have, uh, um, have been incredible with, with me uh, and I'm really grateful um, to it. Um, and every, every time I get, you know, um, support like tonight and, and in general, it just makes me want to do the best job I can do. And um, it, it, hurt, it hurts when you lo lose a game because R Roy will tell you this is a, uh, I think it's a unique club and it's got so many good aspects about it that you feel so proud to be, to be part of it. And, um, um, you know, we obviously have got back into the, into the Premier League and that's a massive thing for not just for the, for the club but for the city. Um, and we just want to keep going. And, um, yeah, uh, 
you know, I'd rather not be talking about me. I'd rather be talking about the club and the, uh, and and the team. But you know, you asked me the question. They've been been amazing with me, and I just, you know, it, four nil down against Leicester, which is a, a local game. And uh, and all we can hear is our supporters. You know, we we've said we've got to start giving something back to them because they're really with us. Um, so um, my focus is to is to be the best version of me. Try and be be as best as I can every day. Really put in the press conference. You know, it's all well and good being a, a manager when things are going well. But I want to show these supporters in this club that I can be um, an half decent manager when uh, things are going uh, not so well as well. Because I think that's what real leadership is. And um, I'm up for it. Steve, because it is the first season back at this level for 23 mm. years. There is some good news. You're off the bottom tonight. As you say, you've stopped this <laughs> sequence of defeats as well with a couple of away games coming up against Wolves and Brighton. How important is it, do you think, that you're going to have to find a settled formation, perhaps even a settled 11 to start moving mm. away? From you know, and that, that's, um, that's what we are trying to do. It's... Um, this is a, a really difficult coaching challenge, I'll be honest with you. And I've said to the players as well, it's difficult for them. You know, a, a, a new set of players, we're playing in the toughest league in the world. And we're finding out about ourselves. I'm finding out about them, not just them as players, but as personalities, as characters. And um, we're doing it on the job. And, like, you know, and that's a real motivation for me now, because if we can, if we can get success in this season, it will be, uh, it will be brilliant. But, as you, you know, there's a lot of work to do. And, like, you know... That's not exactly how I want the team to look and how to play, you know, I, I believe in, in different things to that, but I believe it was the right thing for tonight and uh, we can build on it. We go to Wolves on, on the weekend and um, do our very best to make another forward step. Much. Uh, good guys. point well, tonight. Well, for the rest of the season, it sounds like he's really embracing this, this challenge and he recognises it is a challenge, Roy. Yeah, I think even there he's, he's almost changed his mindset. I think when you come up and he's got this way of playing, but I'm sure he's had to look at over the last week and been thinking, Again, we need to be more solid at the back. He's mentioned here the goals have been conceding, they've been so so open. So you can have a philosophy the way you want to play, but management is about survival. And they had to get something basically tonight. I think again the the players have mentioned it. They had to stop the rot. And we mentioned earlier, sometimes before a game when you're near the bottom, you hear managers and players and fans saying it's a must win game. No, sometimes just getting something out of the game. I think it was a big point. Again he's mentioned there that kind of trying to get some momentum into the club, the feel good factor. And a point, don't shy away from taking a point, it's, it's a big point for Forrest. Makes it a really important first goal that they scored tonight, Jamie. It was, it, it, it was. And it's got to be a concern for Steve Cooper at the other end, that goal after goal from outside the box. Yeah, they didn't strike, don't go around, but previously I've looked at the goalkeeper. Shots, big problem but, from. I mean, to be fair on that goal, I think it's the only time in the game Yates never got a free kick. <laughs> <laughs> he had seven tonight. <laughs> Yeah, he thought he should have had one for that. 18 is the record that a Premier League side has conceded. From Hesitate, and that's, that's enough. That's split second. Ball's in the back of your net. Let's have a look at the penalty appeal, James. As he gets for it, don't it? Here we go. Let's, let's do my, our own VAR. Get my glasses. Does he get a touch on it? Oh, does he get sure. a little bit? <laughs> nice. Take it back. He's in the studio. <laughs> Get my glasses. I need my glasses. I wonder what Stephen Gerrard makes of it all. We'll find out in just a moment. Another away point. That's not to be sniffed out in the Premier League in just a moment. Do stay with us. Well, it's another point for Aston Villa tonight, but in many ways, it's another frustrating evening. One apiece against bottom side Forest. Let's get Stephen Gerrard's Shrek Whelan. I think we should have won. I don't think we've created enough uh, or enough clear-cut chances to say that we uh, deserve to win it, but um, it's certainly a game that we came here uh, expecting to win. Outside of two or three decent opportunities, we need to create more, we need more quality. There's too much wrong with the performance up to a certain point, but uh, I feel like I'm saying that too much of late. That it wasn't a foul, he gets clear contact on the ball, the guy runs into and falls over, so Anthony Taylor got that wrong. You're not pointed with that decision, but having said that, we still need to defend. Uh, he's better than we did. Things. Did you have him in mind as a goal scorer? Well, listen, it's a fantastic strike, and I think that's one of a very few moments of quality we got in the final third. It's an, mm. Actually, he's really leading by example at the moment. He's, he's given us everything he's got. Um, um, and I think it's quite clear where we are right now. We're, we're grinding at the moment. We're, we're close to getting uh, turning draws into wins, but for us to do that, we need big players in important more for us. And there's certainly the last couple of games we're going away frustrated, and if we had that bit of quality, we wouldn't be. Half time. What did you try to change at the? We're all week, we we've spoke to the players and we've worked on getting more bodies in the box. You know, quality in the final third. We 
we attack and players at it. We tried to change our system a bit to be more positive and more bold. We we got Cameron Archer out there. We finished with a really bold uh, team out there to try and find that bit of quality, that bit of magic in the final today. One in off, Esri Konza was involved in a challenge with Ryan Yates. I haven't seen the incident. I'm, I'm sure when I look at back, when I look back at it, but. That's not really important to me at the moment. The, the important thing is um, how I can get this team to be more potent, uh, quality, and um, you know we challenge the players in the forward positions to give this team more when we do. Important in an instant in the middle of the pitch. What you'll find that solution. It, um, application. Uh, a lot of our performance is okay up till a certain point, but um, if you look around our dressing room and you see Coutinho, Buendia, Watkins, Ings, Bale. I need these players to, to step up and provide big moments and go and be headline writers for us. It's a free kick or not in the build-up to the uh, opening goal from Nottingham Forest. It's absolutely not. It doesn't go forward. Uh, and listen, it's one of them, if you, if, you're, if you are the manager of that team, you say, you've got to touch on the ball. You, you know, you, we hear managers speak like that all the time. But I just think it was a bit excessive in terms of how aggressive he was. And then he was totally opposite when the ball comes in. That's exactly. a big frustration. Because exactly. Steve actually said that. You still got to defend the, the, you know, the cross when it comes in. Yeah. Does it sound like the um, the right things, the lack of quality in the attacking areas, particularly from crosses? Yes. End of the game, they're not getting anywhere near enough from from Coutinho. Miles. Off. In terms of the quality from the wide positions, we're doing in terms of getting players in the box. Now, this. In terms of not interviews after the games, uh, bored or frustrated, I swear I'd look and he's mentioned the players individually. He knows these players have scored at this level. It's not as if he's took lads from the championship. So I think the frustration would be them, their decision making, again, the frustration must be, I think we said three shots on target. So for all their possession and getting bodies in the box, they've had three shots on target. That's nowhere near good enough when he's talking about the players we're mentioning. Some of them might be, might be off it, Coutinho, you know, you're looking at him going, how long do you wait for him? If Gerard gets to January, these players are still not producing, there, might, there does get to a point where you've got to make changes at your club. You've got to say to these lads, I'm giving you opportunities. If, if Gerard gets to January, you, you've said if there, this, this crucial period coming up between now and the World Cup, could, you, could this be the maker or the breaker, do you think? Yeah, but uh, every manager seems to be under pressure. We, do, we do managers near the top, near the bottom, and Gerard has to be under pressure because they're not winning enough matches. And that's a tough run of games, of course it is. And you're not scoring goals, so you're constantly under pressure. Seven this season. It's nowhere near good enough. Nowhere near good enough for... For, for a, cl a club and a team like Aston Villa. The, the problem is, the problem is the goals, of course. But it's not that you look at the underlying numbers underneath it and think if they've been unlucky, they're not actually creating enough. You think of the possession they had tonight. Now they've scored a goal from outside the box. Their actual xG was under one because the goal was such a, a great goal, and that is the big problem. And he, and he said that himself. When you look at the names on paper. And we all do it. You look at Villa's attacking players and think, there's some good players in there. What, what, what's happening? But it's just not happening for them at all. Now, you can also look at the, the manager. Because what I mean by that is, I think in the past, when we had managers, a lot of the football was almost, you were organised defensively. And the attacking play, certainly the manager I played for, was a bit like, off the cuff, you're waiting for your, your player to do something special. And that would be Stevie for us as a player. And whether that's... As I said earlier in the show, the big influences for Stevie as a manager, probably Rafa Benitez and Gerard Hulia. He, they look a very organised team, Villa. They're not going to get beat three or four by anyone, not too often, but they can't go at the other end. Now, is he waiting for someone to do a piece of brilliance? Or as a, as a manager or as coaching staff, do they need to provide a pattern of play, a setup, get more players in the box, to actually provide these players who a lot of people think have got quality, to actually get better chances? That's the... I don't know what's right or wrong there, but certainly individually, and I, I don't want to feel like I'm picking on Philip Coutinho, but he looks like a five-a-side player. That's the best way to describe him. It looks like the pitch is too big. Every time he gets the ball, it's a little one round the corner trying to get it back. You, you play with players like that, small-sided games in training, little ones who's all... And it just feels like it's too quick, the players are too powerful, and he can't actually get around the pitch. If he gets away from someone, he can always get back to him. He's having literally he's, the same conversation after the Leeds last week. Yeah. Leeds played with, with 10, 10 players for most of the second half. You're playing a Forest team here who have conceded a record number of goals, and he's the same interview afterward. They're not finding a way, and he's against teams that... They were there for the taking, and that's why you need courage with your attacking players. Get a desire to score a goal. It'd be different. You could come off the pitch and go 1-1, one, one, the keeper made six brilliant saves, he's man of the match, that happens. But when you walk off and it's 1-1, one, one, you're thinking, we've not even tested the goalkeeper. And he, again, you're looking at your attacking players. They're key for them. And go, look, lads, that's, 
the bottom line is you've got to put the ball in the back then. That's where you're in the team for. And you're not doing it, like I said, if you get to January, listen, he'll get to January, hopefully he does. Then you have to get players in who go, you can score the goals for Aston Villa because these lads aren't doing it at this moment in time. You can't keep waiting. The spark tonight came from 37-year-old Ashley Young, the second oldest player to score for Aston Villa in the Premier League, would be an old friend of yours. Steve Starton. Peter Schmeichel. Peter Schmeichel. <laughs> 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 but, <He's> friend. <laughs> Roy's yeah. favourite three players. We will find out in three section next. New on Boris, who are their favourite managers? Which songs does Roy sing along to in the car on the way to Monday Night Football? <laughs> Finished uh, tonight, one apiece between Forrest and Aston Villa. Lots more to come from us, though, before we leave you on Monday Night Football, including our top three section. For that, though, let's have a look at uh, how one special player, and that was goal 700. He's done it at Sporting, in a first spell at Manchester United, 450 in 438 games at Real Madrid, and then a century of goals at Juventus, and he's still scoring now for Manchester United. What strikes you as, as the most incredible thing about it? Is it the talent, Roy? Is it the work rate that's gone into it? Or is it the longevity? Uh, the, the longevity is key. That's what that, that's why, what makes him great. The amount of goals he scored, the different leagues when he first started off. Again, he was a wide player. He wasn't probably that natural goal scorer. But as the years have gone on, he's improved in every aspect of his game. His desire, he's 37, even his goals record there for United is fantastic. Everything about the kid, I think, everything about him, when he first came to United 17, he had that hunger, that desire. Listen, I can't speak highly enough of him, uh, well, he's you, amazing. You, the thing that fascinates me on the actual graphic, he, just, he, he wasn't like an, uh, a natural goal scorer when he first came to Manchester United. You look at Haaland now, he's just scored goals all his life as a young age. That's the thing that strikes me, is that what his record is like when he goes to Real Madrid, it becomes a goal a game and it's, it's continued ever since. How, how do you think he's done? It's almost like he's made himself a goal scorer, which is the, obviously the hardest thing to do in football. I think he's got that football intelligence. I think he's a student of the game. He's always wanting to learn, even now he's always wanting to... And he's also got the international goals. His record at international level, obviously, is fantastic. He's done it, obviously, with his country. He's won a major trophy. You could obviously, he's been playing in some really good teams there. But I think the way he's learned, learned his trade, as he got a bit older, you could see him change his game. Of course, when he was younger, he was a dribbler and he was about beating players. But as he got older, he realised, he thought, I'm not getting involved in that. He's just getting on the end of stuff. That football intelligence, a lot of it one-touch finishing, the types of goals he's got, his personality. He's won the big prizes, you know, particularly at Real Madrid. He was amazing. And even his, even his mentality to come back to Man United, I thought that was a... I, I, I gave him a big thumbs up for that because he's... To come back to United where he'd done great stuff and again to be question marks, but even his goals record there, he's come back to a Man United a club, I suppose, in a, not, in a, not, in a, not in a great place in terms of the, where they're standing on the field at the moment, where they're struggling, it's left behind a lot of other teams. He's come back and again, he's shown real desire to come back and do well for the club. So I take my hat off to him for that. I wonder if someone like Ronaldo, one of the best that there's ever been, has experienced any self-doubt before. This is something that we were talking about last week on Monday Night Football with, with, with you, Jamie, and, and Gary Neville as, as well. And both of you two were really honest about times and periods in your careers where you had to had a little time where you had to speak to somebody outside the football club and, and try and get your head straight, trying to put things in, in, in context. What about you, Roy, as someone who was really at the top of your game for so long? Did you ever go through any dark moments like yeah, that? Yeah, constantly. I think when you're playing top-level sport, there's always that doubt. There's an element of fear. When you're going to games or you've had an injury or a contract situation, yeah, I think that. I think that's the most natural thought process in the world. You're going to have a bit of self-doubt, but sometimes that can keep you on your toes. A, a, a bit of fear, going into big games. Uh, yeah, I, I had that throughout my career. And I think even the likes of Ronaldo, they would have gone through all that, as brilliant as they are. You look at Ronaldo over the last month or two, you know, big question marks about where he stands at Man United. Is he going to be in the team? Then he gets a chance last night and performs. So I think that's part of any sports person's journey. A bit of self-doubt. But I, I, I think it's not a bad thing. It keeps you keeps the hunger there. I'm asking particularly because it is World Mental Health Day. And, and it's something that we don't really talk about, I think, naturally in a, in a football environment. Is it something that you uh, perhaps experience more as a, a manager than a player? 
Uh, yeah, well, I, from my experience, it's definitely tougher as a manager. Of course, when you're a player, you're, you just, in a sense, obviously, you're just looking after yourself, your own performances. And when things are going great, Steve Cooper mentioned they're great. It's, uh, when anyone sports career, when it's going well, you're getting pats on the back. It's easiest when you get those, those challenges, particularly for a manager. When you're losing football matches, you've got a big responsibility, your players, your staff, board, your supporters, whatever, the media side of things. So, yeah, I, but I just think that's all part of the journey. It's, 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 when, it's, when was it bad for you? Um, particularly, I suppose for a manager, I suppose my big struggles really were when I went to Ipswich. Made some poor decisions, couldn't get any momentum into the club, struggled to get people on side, made some poor decisions as a manager regarding recruitment. and um, Yeah, that, that was certainly a struggle, but that's, again, that's all part of it. But I, I, in a strange way, I think I learnt more probably from my time at Ipswich than my other coaching roles, or obviously when I was manager of Sunderland. It's all... I think it's, again, as I've said earlier, it's all part of your journey. You, you, you've got to take the, the good and the bad and have some sort of balance are, to it. Are we sort of talk we, quite glibly sometimes about managers' futures and being fired or sure, being yeah. hired? And what's that feeling actually well, like? It's not your good. job's on the line. Yeah, well, you it's, are it, sad. yeah it's brutal. It's, it's brutal it's for, for any manager. We see managers constantly, the last few days, really good managers and good people losing their jobs and fans and... Again, we're quick to say, and listen, we're obviously on that side of it now, and we can be saying, well, manager's under pressure. It's brutal. You know, I lost, you know, when you, when you, when you lose your job, if you're losing football matches, you are going to lose your job. Um, yeah, uh, particularly as a manager, I think you, 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 you do suffer to set back your confidence, your pride, ego, and your family suffer. And that's what we've got to remind ourselves when we do see managers losing their jobs. And as I said, really good managers recently lost their jobs. Good managers are good people. And it's like, oh, well, he deserved that, he didn't. No, no, you know, sometimes you've got to give people a break. Roy, Roy can I ask you about management in uh, the West Brom job tonight? You're actually one of the favourites. I don't want to obviously get into that. But it still feels to me like you'd like to go into management. Is that right or not? Yeah, I hope so, yeah. I, I want to keep what that is, door open. What is the... Because I, it, it fascinates me that, and I'll go back to, I don't know if you ever remember... When we, we did Pundit, the first time I did Pundit, he was with Roy, with, with, with you, uh, probably 10 years ago in the European Championships. It was you, Gareth Southgate, myself, and then Roberto Martinez. So those three had all, all been managers. You, you and Gareth were out of jobs at the time. And throughout the trip, you know, you're having a, a couple of drinks or a meal after the game. The conversation was always obviously around football. And it was always constantly negative stories about management, maybe a player that let you down, an age, not you specifically, everybody within the group. And I was listening, because I was at the stage where I was just coming to the end of my career, and I was dipping my toe into coaching, getting my badges and doing a bit of punditry. And it just fascinated me the way everyone still wanted to go into management, you still do now. But it feels like a lot of the time you speak to people, a lot of the stories and the feedback comes back as negative. And, and I'll be totally honest, I mean, I'm not going to get offered a job, it's not my thing, but I don't think there's a job in football, even at the club that I love at Liverpool, that I would leave my role for now, because I actually love my life, I love talking about football, it gives me family time, I don't have to move away from home. What, what is the, the real itch to get back in? I think sometimes when I do a lot of the media stuff, I, I think sometimes that can leave me unfulfilled. I still think mm. I have something to offer as a, a manager. That's the bottom line, I still think I could, I could do something with a club. Uh, is, is that to, to help players or just is it a... Like a, a you know, I think I can help players really, and I think I could be a good manager. No, I mean that feeling, and the thing I miss as a, as a play is winning. That, that feeling of like when the whistle went, that is definitely something I... Oh, well, that's, the, well, well, that's the feeling you miss, of course, you don't, don't miss the losing. Well, is that, is that what yeah, that's part, to the, that that's part, part of the bug, obviously. You want to go back and you feel you can fix a club and if you're fixing a club and you're winning football matches, and the feel, feel good factor comes back and you feel... But, it, but, but everyone who goes into a job, think they can do that. That's why it's got to be the right job in the right time or whatever it might be. I'm not, you also have to be careful what you wish for. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be quick to give up what I'm doing now because I have a good life and I enjoy what I'm doing. But sometimes I feel there's something in the pit of my stomach that feels I should have another go at it and that won't go away. Still at weekends on a Saturday if I'm going to matches, I still have that urge to maybe go back into it. It's simple as that and it's hard to shake it off. But Listen, I, I mightn't get that opportunity again. I, I know that. And, and I've had a few opportunities. So, I, I, listen, I count my blessings for that as well. But if it happens, if something happens, great. If not, obviously life goes on. I can't believe you'd be unfulfilled working with Jamie and I on Monday Night Football. No, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs>
just on the West Brom, I, I need to ask you this question, Andy, because you are the favourite, and it does happen every couple of months, you're the favourite for a job. Has there been any bizarre. contact? No, bizarre. I've been, I, I, I think the, the bookies do play silly games with people, and um, no, it's, uh, I think I was favourite for a few jobs over the last year or two, and it was all, all nonsense. Same for any speculation over the last 24, 48 hours. Absolute rubbish. And if you were working as a manager, you wouldn't be able to sit here and uh, answer the questions I'm about to ask you, Roy. So this is what I'd really miss, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this will fulfil them. <laughs> we talk about tonight, well, let's, let's put the boys on the spot in terms of their top threes. We'll have some football categories, we'll have some non-football categories, and at the end of it all, we perhaps got a better, more all-round picture of their lives, their, their likes and their loves and their passions. So, three current Premier League footballers? Kevin De Bruyne, I think he's been the best player in the league uh, for four or five years. You've got to say Haaland now is an absolute global superstar. And despite his form this season, I'm going to still say Virgil van Dijk because I think he's been absolutely amazing over the last four or five years and transformed Liverpool where they were when he came into where they've been in the last few years. And how would you say? No, that, listen, it hasn't been great, but I'm not going to judge him on eight games when he's been amazing for five years. Okay. Roy? Time, De Bruyne, Haaland and Ronaldo. Mm. De Bruyne, obviously, I played midfield. I think is what he does week in, week out, consistent. He's fantastic. We see what Haaland's done already. Obviously, we knew he's new to the Premiership. Amazing what he can achieve over the next few years, particularly playing with a really good team like City, working with obviously Pep. And you have to give Ronaldo credit, scoring last night 700 goals in his career. Amazing. Premier League managers. Managers I like. I'm I've always had loads of time for Pep. I think what he does to his teams, I know people say he's always worked with the best players and the big clubs and big budgets, blah, blah, blah. But he still has to work with them, he still has to manage them, he still has to find a style of play, still has to go out a year and year out. I like what he does. I like Brentford manager, Thomas Frank, is that right? Yeah, I like him. I think I like the way he comes across, even when he was in the Championship a few years ago, I came across him. Really good guy. And I like Graham Potter at Chelsea. What do you like about him? I just like, uh, I like the way his teams play, I like the way he comes across in the media, I'm delighted he's got a chance at a big, big club like Chelsea, there's all this talk, how can he manage a big club and big egos and all this, but give the man a chance, he's settling really well, he's, every time he sp speaks in interviews I think he comes across really well, so yeah, those, those, those are the three for me. Guardiola, Frank and Potter, Jamie? I would say, I would, listen, I'd say you know, Klopp and Pep, uh, I think it'd be a really sad day when both of those managers leave the Premier League. I think the more the managers, the huge figures and personalities. And the other one, I was going through the leagues, but I, I would say Mikel Arteta for a number of reasons, not because obviously them being top of the league now, more the fact that I think he's been, I, I love managers who are really brave and make big, big decisions that might be unpopular, but I love a manager to make a decision. And I think what he did with Obama Young, uh, what he did with investing in all the young players, and he's had a bit of criticism at different times, his young manager's first job, but the way they play, what they've created now at Arsenal, whether they take it to the next level of winning trophies, I don't know, but I just like the fact he's made big decisions. Something different, talking of big decisions, top three holiday destinations. Ooh. Ibiza, uh, <laughs> got to be. Uh, I, I mean, with I the, mean the Gary, Gary Neville went there last summer. Uh, and he just said, uh, that's Liverpool in the sun, Ibiza. That's how he described <laughs> it. But I would say, the places I love to go, Ibiza, Glastonbury, is just my favourite four or five days of the year. And I would say anywhere in Italy. I've just come back from Italy, really classy, really top, that's top draw. Nice. Roy? Um, my favourite holiday destination I've been to on safari, on Holland, South Africa, fantastic. Really found it amazing. Very... Uh, Peaceful and spiritual, I found spiritual. it. Spiritual? Yeah, just, yeah, getting close to the, the wild animals, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which one did you most associate yourself with? Uh, probably the, the, the lion, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. You wanted me to say that. No, it was a really magical holiday. Uh, also had a, a couple of weeks in Australia, which I really enjoyed. Sydney was amazing. And uh, had a, a week or two in Argentina, which I found brilliant, brilliant, uh, brilliant holiday also. Very good. Cosmopolitan. Top three football grounds? That I enjoy playing at. I would definitely have to say uh, oh, Highbury. It? Highbury was definitely one of my favourites as a player, certainly. Um, Anfield, I made my debut. Uh, was it about the tunnel of Highbury that you liked? It was a bit tight, yeah. It was a bit tight, yeah. <laughs> no, the pitch, the pitch, and it was dead tight. Listen, the atmosphere back then at Highbury when there was a lot between you know, us and uh, well, United and Arsenal was fantastic. Pitch was brilliant. Uh, real old fashioned ground. I've mentioned Anfield, and, and you know what, I'll have to put in Old Trafford, that was uh, a magical ground.
Jamie? Anfield, you know, obvious reasons. I, w- I would say Tottenham's ground right now. I think we, we've probably very rarely but ever had, you know, an English team having the best stadium in the world. But I think argue could, you know, you could argue Tottenham Stadium in terms of how it's set up. And I'd say Goodison. Again, memories there as a kid, but that sort of old fashioned ground that we don't see too much. They've only got another, I think, a year and a half at that place. Yeah. So, a lot of memories, at, uh, a couple of them, and uh, Spurs' ground's fantastic. This is going to be a tough one. Top three movies, Roy. Oh. Uh, do you want to go far? Uh, yeah. Come on, then. Let's okay. go, Jamie, first. My favourite movie is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, Jack Nicholson, and uh, Nurse Ratchet, who uh, sadly passed away. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, but that's my favourite film of all time. Uh, hilariously funny. I would say The Usual Suspects, the twist at the end is just like... I remember watching it, and the twist at the end, I almost felt like I had to go and watch say, it again. too much, yeah. Some people might not have watched it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and number old. three, I'm sure I'll get the seal of approval from Roy, The Commitments. I mean, one of the funniest films uh, <laughs> you'll ever see. So they're my top three. Is that in your Good choice? Your yeah, yeah. No, no, I didn't go with that, but the brilliant choices, I have to say. No, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is definitely my top Isn't three. It? Absolutely fantastic, yeah. Uh, and also The Devil Will Be Blood, Daniel Day-Lewis, mm. an amazing movie. And Shawshank Redemption would oh, be my yeah, three yeah, favourite, yeah. but the commitment, amazing. Would movie. Daniel Day Lewis be your favourite actor? Yeah, amazing, absolutely brilliant. In that movie, I thought he was absolutely fantastic. You met him? No, not yet. Mm, one day. Uh, right, back to football. Top three footballers of all time. Have we already talked about one tonight? Yeah, of all time. I think yeah, you just little, well, I've, I've, I've certainly gone with Ronaldo, but I was looking at players in the Premier League. I've gone Ronaldo, Rooney, and Thierry Henry. The other three, I thought, were brilliant. Well, it, players, it, ever though, if you were picking them, sort oh, of. No, but if you want to, I thought the question was the Premier League. No, but the players I would admire, obviously Maradona would have to be up there. Ronaldo, and I'd probably say Zidane for me as well has to be up there. I thought he was amazing. I was lucky enough to play against him. Brilliant player, nasty, scored a goal, won the big prizes. Hard to beat that. Mm. Jamie, I, I. I I, I didn't forget players I hadn't seen it, so I didn't want to get involved in, you know, Cruyff or Pelé and things like that. So the, the players have just made me go, wow, you know, since I've been watching football from the mid-80s. But number one for me would be Messi. Uh, and I, I said last week, I think it, I'd love to see sort of, I, I think if Argentina won the World Cup, it'd almost cement him, I think in a lot of people's eyes, as maybe the number one. But he's number one. Maradona, just what he did in 86. I was a young kid watching it, like, couldn't believe what I was watching. And I would, I'd agree with Roy, I would go Zidane, of, of sort of the modern generation. There was a lot of players I was thinking of, but I just think Zidane, what he did in the, in the biggest moments, you think of the World Cup final, the goal of Hams and Champions League final, his performance in the Euros 2000, that the one he was like, special. Uh, what music are these guys listening to? <laughs> <laughs> Top three artists or musicians? Well, I'm going to see Bob Dylan tomorrow night. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that should be a good gig. I like watching Bob. Music, if I'm listening to my car, but a U2, Red Hot Chili Peppers. I love my 80s music. I'll always have that station on in the car, 80s. Yeah, I love it. I Go love 80s. The... It's all right. Yeah, I love, oh, I love it. Yeah, love it, yeah. more Deacon Blue. Anything for the 80s I love. Jamie? Uh, I've got to go for the Beatles, haven't I? But uh, Oasis, <laughs> uh, I love Oasis. I must say. I mean, I, I would, uh, I'd love them to get together, but I know they're not uh, on speaking terms. Uh, and the Arctic Monkeys, hopefully, they're, back on, tour. they're yeah. back on tour, and hopefully they're going. Make sure you get to Glastonbury in the summer because uh, it'll save me a few quid uh, getting tickets for this uh, <laughs> this tour now. Uh, it's not just football that dominates their lives. There's other sports as well. So, uh, Jamie, you can start us off on this. What it, three? You would love to I'll, watch I'll, or be involved. I in. have to be honest. I'm not. I'm, I just. I'm that obsessed with football that it, other sports I don't really watch that much. But things that really, I love like the Olympics. I'm watching the athletics. Not so much every sport, but watching the sort of the track and you know all the different you know the athletes. Are. So I love the athletics at the Olympics. I'm going to say watching the Lions. I wouldn't say I love rugby, but when the Lions are playing, I don't know what it is. It just gets me hooked. That thing of four teams coming together, that badge, the shirt. I always watch the documentaries and they're amazing. So I'd say the Lions, and I'd say test cricket, but England, Australia, that, that thing where you can you, you feel like you can really get involved in it emotionally, that, that thing of cricket does fascinate me, the, the mental strength, the bravery, you know, batsmen, the bowlers, bouncers, you know, that type of thing. So I, I would say athletics, the Lions and the, the Ashes. 
Roy? Do you know, I watch most sports. I really do have a lot of interest. But my, my favourite would be, I like, I like American football. I like rugby league. What is I it about like, NFL? I just remember watching it, obviously, a kid growing up in Ireland. I just always followed it and was always interested. Got been fortunate to get to a few Super Bowls. Obviously, got to a game the weekend. Just always enjoyed watching it. I've always been intrigued by it. Um, rugby I, like, I like rugby league. I think rugby league is a really tough sport. I think it's brilliant. And obviously, growing up in Ireland, obviously, I'm a big J.A. fan. Loved the best game to watch, the live game, I suppose, is a really good game of hurling. If you ever get a chance to go to an All-Ireland, it's a great day out, one of the best. So um, they would be mine. But I, I love watching more sports. But would you, if you, if you're going to go to one big event, would it be to go to a Super Bowl in America? The Super, Bo yeah, Super Bowl maybe in America is fantastic, or, or any any game, or any, any American uh, football game in America. But it's a sporting occasion. I, I, I do have to say, I think a, a hurling all Ireland final in Ireland is just really hard to beat. It's a great day out, especially if Cork are playing. Obviously, my hometown. Leads us to our penultimate question. Top three sports people of all time. Jamie, go first on that. I, I, I chose people who I've have watched, you know, so I didn't want to, you know, maybe some people always think of Muhammad Ali and that one, but I've never, I just wanted people who'd taken my breath away watching them. And Usain Bolt, just watching him in sort of the 100 metres and the 200 metres, how far ahead he was of everybody uh, at the time. So I'd have to say Usain Bolt. And also sports that, I pick sports that I like, if, if you like. So I had to go one for boxing, and I, I just thought Floyd Mayweather. I know he's not everyone's cup of tea the way he acts off, uh, off the pitch, outside the ring. But in terms of just never being beaten, every fight he's had, he's just, he's beaten everybody. Uh, so I went for Mayweather. And the last one I went for Ronnie O'Sullivan. Uh, sports people. Yeah, but that's a still sport, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the reason be, I, I, I keep going back to people who take your breath away. It's it's not just that Ronnie O'Sullivan's the best snooker player of all time. He, he can play both hands. I know people say, you know, football, both feet, but playing snooker with your left-handed, you know, getting a one four seven in five minutes, you know, things that you just go, wow, no one else is ever going to do that. Extraordinarily talented. I was joking, Ronnie. Um, <laughs> come on then, Roy. Top three sports people. Uh, for, again, growing up, I, I would go with Muhammad Ali. I think I just love watching any of his old fights, his interviews. Obviously, the influence that he had on people. Superstar all over the world. Amazing. Uh, growing up, and again, in Ireland, the GA was a big part of my life. Hurling, watching Jimmy Barry Murphy playing for Cork. You know, brilliant sportsman. And again, as a young a young person growing up, around, watching Barry McGuigan on the television oh, fighting, yeah. I just remember Barry. You know, the, we'd all be glued to it. Obviously, it was brilliant. Or just Irish people like Dennis Taylor, but uh, yeah, Barry McGuigan would have to be up there. Yeah. Would he? But, would he been your sort of hero as a kid? Yeah, well, I, I, I think hero is a strong word, but certainly people you look to, you go, listen, they're doing well for themselves. Good luck to them, and yeah, they're trying to they maybe inspire you, of course. Final category: top three pundits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, we We've done a deal, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we <laughs> haven't done a trade deal. I will go with <laughs> Roy. The three I've picked are completely different. So I think Roy is the absolute master of cutting through. Maybe he may feel a nonsense. Me and Neville come out with going into, you know, we just, pff, one word can just pff, change it, light up a studio, change the mood, get to the point, uh, really. So I think Roy is, there's no one better at that. I would have to say uh, my companion Gary, in terms of going into deep, you think of what he did last week with, with Trent, going into you know that side He's of it. taking this question very seriously, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, of course. And I'm going to go for Big Meeks, uh, Big Mike, because he's completely different. So you've got sort of someone who gets right to the thrust of it, uh, Gary who goes into a bit more detail, and Mike uh, who brings that sort of lightheartedness. So I've picked those three because they are the three people I like working with the best. All right, I'll tell that to uh, Graham and Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> and Roy, it's not, it's not who you include, it's who you leave out. Right, it's yeah, the, the tricky course. thing. Come on. Well, I, I have to go with Jamie. As I said, we've done a deal. Yeah. Uh, again, what, what, what does help when you listen to people like Jamie, obviously they're very passionate. They love what they do, and I think that comes across. So, yeah, don't want to embarrass you, but I'll go with you, Jamie. I think Nev's really good. I'll have to go with Nev, because, again, I, I obviously I want tickets for the Salford games. <laughs> <laughs> and I like Graham. I think Graham Souness, because again, when I was growing up, I'd watch Graham as a player, and uh, I, th I thought he was a brilliant player, so I always had that influence on me to be played, uh, what he won, and I've done some work with him, and uh, again, I think Graham is... What, what did you think uh, of Thinks pundits? along the same lines as me, I think. What, what do you think of pundits when you're like, you're a player? If, it feels like the, 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 we're in it. This pundit world feels like it's exploded over yeah. the last sort of maybe 10 years. 
Well, there's a lot more games, obviously, on the yeah. TV now than when we were playing, I suppose. I don't think I ever took too much notice, did you? I, re I really didn't. No, but I, I used to watch other football shows. I mean, the, the one I used to, you know, I, I think it's, if I think of, like, pundits when I was a kid, I, I mean, Satan Greaves, he was just, like, something that, I, I don't know if that was something Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, kid. brilliant. That no, was a brilliant programme, yeah, Satan Greaves, yeah. Highlight of the week, watching that. Yeah, Satan Greaves were brilliant. Yeah, and it was, again, it was light-hearted. And mm. It was entertainment. And then you'd have football. Brilliant. Spare a thought for poor old Michael Richards, who's just sobbing on his sofa right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not picking it on no three. chance. Jesus. And we were going to do presenters as well, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Yeah. So <laughs> let's smut more about you now, and thank you to Jamie as well. In the Midlands tonight, Forrest dropped the bottom. Finished one apiece between them and Aston Villa. Bye from us. It is move above Leicester who will be there with this point than their visitors. Nottingham Forest 1, Aston Villa 1.